Welcome to the Brain Injury Association of New York State's webinar, So You Want to Be an Advocate. I am Carla Giovaniello, Brain Injury Training and Services Project Director here at the Brain Injury Association of New York State. Thank you for joining us. Before we begin, a few housekeeping details. Because of limited time, we ask that you please hold we ask that you please hold questions until the end of the presentation. During the Q&A session, questions can be submitted via the question text window. The text box option should be visible to you on the GoToWebinar toolbar on your desktop. If you are having trouble viewing this option, please contact Citrix Tech Support at 1-800-263-6317. Again, that number is 1-800-263-6317. This number should also be visible on your toolbar. Judy will do her best to answer questions in the order that they are received. Any questions she is unable to address may be submitted via email to the association. We will be recording this webinar session and plan to post it, along with the PowerPoint slides, to our website, www.biaNYS.org. Information about contacting the association and viewing the webinar will also be provided in a follow-up email after the webinar has concluded. Before I turn the microphone over to Judy, let us begin with a quick poll to see who is in our audience today. Please take a moment to answer the question. I'm going to close the poll in one moment. Okay. It looks like we do have a, a rather diverse crowd, uh, so thank you all again for joining. We're excited to start, and it is with sincere pleasure that I introduce our webinar presenter for today, Judith Abner. Judy is the Executive Director of the Brain Injury Association of New York State, where she has worked for 17 years supporting the organization's mission, advocating on behalf of individuals with brain injury and their families, and promoting prevention. Judy, good morning. Good afternoon, and hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to have the opportunity to present this webinar this afternoon, So You Want to Be an Advocate. This is a subject near and dear to the hearts of many of us, certainly on the staff and board of the Brain Injury Association of New York State and to many of our members. Uh, everybody, pretty much with whom I speak, talks about advocacy and their interest in being an advocate, being involved in advocacy and having the opportunity to share their information and expertise with those who are in decision-making positions, whether in government, in the agencies, in the legislature, and the like. So it is a subject near and dear to our hearts, and I'm really delighted to kick off a in, uh, more intensive look at advocacy for the Brain Injury Association through this webinar. Just a few uh, introductory comments, one of the things we discovered is that for some reason the slides that you'll be seeing today have decided to be animated. And so I apologize in, in advance if that's something that some of you find annoying or disturbing. I have no idea how it got there, but I think we can all get through it together. You'll still have the information. It just will be presented in a more dynamic fashion in terms of the slides than it might otherwise be. Second comment is that we will be presenting 
two or three workshops in different parts of the state in the fall on this topic as well. So if you would like more information or want to share the information with others, you can encourage them to participate in that as well. Okay, I think without further ado, uh, let me put down the speaker and we will get started. Okay, so the topic is, so you want to be an advocate. Oops, excuse me. Now, I'm sorry, I'm a little, there we go. Okay, so although this says Brain Injury Association, New York 2012, actually this is a picture of advocacy that was taken back in the 90s. And those of you who know our current president, Dr. Marie Cavallo, may recognize her up in the front of, uh, of this picture. This is taken from a demonstration that was held in Washington, D.C. back in the 80s. And that was a demonstration that eventually led to the passage by Congress of the uh, Brain Injury uh, Act. And that was very exciting. But this is just a picture taking you back to close to the beginning of our organization and understanding that advocacy was the beginning of our organization and of the progress that was made around brain injury and services for people with, for people with brain injury. Okay, so what is an advocate? Oh, here we go. I apologize for the uh, for this. So, an advocate, according to Webster's, is one who pleads the cause of another. But actually, I would also far be it from me to presume to modify Webster's. But also, Ed, we understand that this is somebody who speaks for him or herself as well. And we know how important it is for people to speak on behalf of another person. But more importantly, and what we're about in empowerment is being able to speak for yourself. Now, speaking out about issues, I think, is one of the most important things that a person can do. And unfortunately, not enough people do engage in the process in that way. And that's for a number of reasons. Um, sometimes people think, oh, it takes too much time, so I don't want to do it. And while it's true it does take time, what you'll know by the end of this webinar is what some of the steps are. And that, in fact, it probably does not take as much time as you might otherwise think. A second reason is the notion or understanding that a person who advocates has to be an expert on every single thing. And that means for many people that you have to know the answer to whatever question might be asked. Certainly, we would all agree that effective advocacy involves knowing what it is you're talking about, but it also involves understanding that it is okay to say, I'm sorry, I don't know. I'll get back to you with the answer. And this is something I'll come back to later on. Um, another reason that people don't engage in advocacy is a concern of why am I just wasting my time? Nobody listens to me. But actually, if you don't engage, if what somebody in a decision-making position has is silence, that speaks louder many times than you coming forward and sharing your information, your expertise, uh, and the like. So understand that, in fact, unless you speak, you don't have a voice. And if you don't have a voice, you can't be heard. So I start this out by reminding people that you, each of you, is the power and the force. It's your voice that needs to be heard, and it's your voice that's part of, the, that's part of this process. And it's your story that is part of this process. So advocacy can take place on a number of levels. And I'm, I just added this slide so that people understand that the word advocacy more describes an action of speaking for yourself or on behalf of others. But that can take place in many different forums. And these are just some. 
One is on fev federal public policy or state public policy or local public policy. And these are broader kinds of issues. These are the policy issues, resources that have to do with broad programs, uh, with legislation, changes in laws. Uh, maybe a lawsuit that has an impact on a policy and all. It may also be advocating for the needs of a group of individuals with brain injury. So it's not necessarily, the advocacy is not necessarily around a particular legislative change, but just talking about something within, for example, a nursing home environment or something like that. And also many of our members advocate for their own needs or for the needs of a family member or a friend. That is still advocacy. So we need to understand in having this discussion that when we talk about advocacy, we're really talking about sharing information, expertise, telling a story in a variety of different contexts. Now there are different, um, kind of a different program or a different choreography for each one of those but they are all part of advocacy. So why do people advocate? Why should you be involved in advocacy? Why is it important for people to be involved in advocacy? And it's, as I said just before, if you do not speak, if your voice is not heard, it won't be counted. And we know that government or that decision makers affect almost every aspect of what we do in life. And so it's important for us each to engage in the process of making decisions, in the process of deciding how resources are spent. And we certainly know from reading the papers, we know because this is a presidential election year, we know from the most recent Supreme Court decision with regard to health care on a grand scale, that decisions are made all the time that have an impact on how we live our lives. Many other people are involved in this process and it's important for each and every one of us in whatever way we are comfortable to engage in this process as well. So this cartoon is one of my very favorites. It's old, but it is nonetheless very, very timely, and it says, I'm going to make a lot of friends right now before I need them. And I will tell you that that is the start and finish of the story of advocacy. We'll spend a lot of time now going different, going through different steps. But the point of this, and why I always like to start any discussion about advocacy with it, is because we understand that it's important to know players, have people you can go to, but it's really important to try to create those relationships before you need to ask for something. You need to know people. You need to be able to converse with them and reach out before you're reaching out to ask for something. And so I always like to start with this particular piece. And as we go through the slides and through the discussion, you'll have more opportunities to understand what it is that I'm talking about here. Now we are going to be talking a lot about grassroots um, advocacy and much of what I'm going to talk about is focused on the policy related kind of advocacy. However, I will certainly point out and many of the um, items that we'll be discussing are equally applicable when you're doing individual advocacy as well. So why grassroots? Well, that's all of us. And we understand that people, especially elected officials, are in the business of being elected. So often they're elected every two years, certainly for our state legislature, as well as for members of the United States House of Representatives. United States Senate, it's every four years, and our governor and state leaders every four years. But they do care about what you their constituents think, and they need your votes in order to get reelected. They are out of the job if they don't get reelected. And so that becomes very important. And so part of what we seek to do is really to convince people that there is support for something that we're advocating for or against a policy that we don't like, that we're advocating against. So grassroots efforts 
may involve small meetings, generating letters and phone calls, phone calls and letters from community leaders and the like. All of that kind of activity focused on being supporting a particular policy or opposing it is all part of the grassroots efforts in which we become involved. So before we get to the process, just a few things about knowing the process, because this is an important piece of being an effective advocate. So first, know the network. Well, everybody, of course, has a role to play. Now, the roles may be different and are different depending on where you're sitting, but all of those roles work together. It's important to know if you're advocating for a in the legislature, it's important to know whether you are talking to a legislative leader, whether you're talking to a committee chair, uh, information about that legislature, legislator in general, staff, where they sit, what the role of the governor might be, if the governor is the person with whom you're advocating. It's really understanding what that picture looks like as a whole. Now, be polite, I put up, and it's not necessarily, you know, you may think, oh, God, how silly, except I've seen many things that are anything but polite. And, you know, it's the old saying, you win more friends with honey than with vinegar. And it's very easy to cross the line because we all are involved in advocacy out of a passionate feeling about something. And sometimes, frankly, it's very frustrating when the person you're trying to convince doesn't get it or doesn't get it as quickly uh, as, you might, as you might like. And so this is really a fine line in which we need to be sure not to become too pushy or too aggressive, too, but we can be direct, we can be assertive, we can be clear, but always with respect and always with uh, politeness. It's very easy to have a door slammed in your face. And it's easier to have that happen than to open doors. And we all work at opening doors and having the opportunity to go in. Now, part of what we can all do is be helpful. One of the things with folks in the agencies or in the legislature, whether it's on the local, state, or federal level, is everybody is too busy. Everybody has a lot to do, too little staff. Um, everybody is buried, too little time. And so this is an opportunity for you to be helpful and ask what you can do. You can provide information. Uh, on an ongoing basis. And this is part of beginning to make friends. Be helpful. Give a heads up when there's something interesting or important coming down the pike. Work with caseworkers. Work with the legislative constituent staff uh, in helping to connect that individual with community-based services. Those are the kinds of things you know about that you can help the staff be able to do their work. And that's all about becoming a resource. You want to be the person that a staff member will call or will go to or that a reporter will call or will go to when they have a question. And that being helpful in that way really creates a bond for you with the individual that you are um, advocating with. For example, um, one of the issues that the Brain Injury Association has been actively involved in in New York State is the whole process around the recently uh, enacted Sports Concussion Management and Awareness Act. We have been involved in the legislative part of the process. We commented on regulations, and when we go through the process, I'll talk about some of that. But we also, this, the law went into effect on July 1st, one of the things we started doing at the end of June, middle to end of June, and we're doing now into July and will be doing through the summer, is reaching out to those people, the school districts who are responsible for implementing that law, providing resources and saying, we can help you do this. And here are some resources to start with. What else can we do? So it's all of those things that are being proactive in being helpful, that help create a relationship 
that has you at a resource. Now, be a volunteer. This, of course, is if you have time. Never enough staff, and we all know that. So volunteers um, during a campaign or during a session or any time is always helpful and always appreciated by any office. Be an organizer. Again, sometimes uh, it's important to have a public forum, and here you can partner with the Brain Injury Association or be involved in some of the things, activities that we do of bringing people together to provide a public forum for discussing whatever the issue might be. Again, we uh, back on the concussion management uh, law, we created a forum for public discussion that came after passage of the law, but at a time when the agencies were involved in developing regulations, the State Education Department and the Department of Health, the Brain Injury Association convened a roundtable of a diverse group of experts from around the state to discuss what implementation might look like, what, what these experts would like to see in that implementation, and that became a very important part of the process of developing guidelines around it. Now back to my cartoon, be a friend. And it's the old what's a friend for, right? Stay in contact with your elected official. Treat the relationship as an ongoing relationship of importance like any other relationship in your life that matters. Follow up if you happen to be at an event where your local assembly member or state senator or congress member was speaking, just jot down a little note or an email now and say, heard you at the XYZ event or saw you at your town hall. It was great to see you there. Glad you still want to hear what people have to say. Those kinds of things. If your elected official does something that you like, take that opportunity to send a thank you note or, or an email. And it doesn't have to pertain to brain injury because these uh, folks are certainly not single issue people and neither are you. And so it doesn't have to pertain to brain injury, but what that does is show you're interested, is show you're following uh, what that elected official is doing, and positive feedback is always noticed and always gets positive reaction. Also be honest and be truthful. And again, you wouldn't think that we have to say this, but it's very, very important. Stick to the facts. Stick to what you know. And if you don't know the answer, as I said earlier, don't pretend that you do. Don't be tempted to make up an answer. Because the quickest way to lose credibility is to not be truthful. And fudging the truth, those kinds of things, neglecting to mention something, that is noticed, and that really undermines the very thing that you're seeking to establish. So, as I said, it's not, um, there's nothing wrong with saying, I'm sorry, I don't know, I'll get back to you. People respect that and understand that. You can be simple, be direct, and be, and be honest. And finally, be prepared. You do have to do your homework. You do have to know what you're talking about. And while you don't have to know every single thing, you do have to be in command of your subject and all. So here are a few do nots. And when you see this list, you're going to think, oh my god, that's so simple. And in many ways it is, because in my mind, this is very much likened to good manners and understanding how to be polite and understanding how to interact with other people. However, again, I find that it's necessary just to spend a few minutes going over some of these things because it is really important not to torpedo yourself, not to sabotage yourself. So the first thing is do not threaten a legislator. Um, Threats are rare, but I certainly have seen and heard them happening. Things like, I'll get you in the next election, will immediately lose anybody's support. 
and that news will, th will spread and will undermine your credibility. Also, don't behave inappropriately. Don't barge in, don't interrupt when a legislator is talking to another person, even if you have an appointment for a particular time. Don't raise your voice. It's not helpful to start yelling. Really, to pick, pick your fights. Pick the issues that you dig your heels in. Don't make disparaging comments, even if you're talking to somebody who has an opposing position. We understand that things change over time, and you certainly don't want to burn bridges um, as you go forward. And it's very hard to come in with last-minute requests, which is why we started with try to build bridges or make relationships early. Um, they can't always be accommodated when you come in at the last minute. So you have to have been there throughout in order to be able to raise um, to raise an issue. So those are just some quick do nots. And also don't, pre don't um, present a petition with a large number of signatures that you don't know. Also, if you are holding a rally or holding a public event, it's good to have people show up because you don't want to be making a big show of things and then have nobody there. That also undermines your credibility. So Although we're not big on groveling, I put in this cartoon in really helping us understand that we don't want to kiss anybody's feet or knees as the picture shows. And, and I don't believe in groveling, but we do understand that sometimes when we're doing advocacy, there's a way in which we can ask for support that really focuses on the importance of the legislator and why it matters to us in order to go forward. So here's the second poll question for you, and I'd ask you to respond to this question, and then we will show the results. Okay, so this is very interesting. We can see from the, um, from the results that many of you know how a bill becomes a law. So that's very good because we'll go more quickly through that part of the process. Um, as I say, this webinar is really designed to do some very basic introduction to advocacy and the advocacy process. And then we will... Um, talk about moving forward. Whoa. Oh, this animation is very interesting. <laughs> Again, I apologize. You're doing this with me. So I'm seeing the animation here. But um, just a few things. Since so many of you are knowledgeable about this process, and this is a really simplified version of the process, I just wanted to uh, identify a few things very quickly. In terms of the starting point, all legislation or even many of the policy pieces do start with an idea. And an idea comes from comes from anyone or any place. Um, the subjects of bills, and again, here I'm talking about legislation, are varied, come from many places. They come from the legislators themselves. They come from their constituents. They may come from organizations. They may come from state agencies. They may come from reading the newspaper, from events that occur in the, um, in the community. Uh, an idea for legislation may come from some research, medical research or other research that's done that comes up with some suggestions or some findings. The ideas really come from any place and every place. And I like to uh, um, really emphasize this 
because although the process itself uh, has its steps, and I would say from my own experience, this um, sort of one slide schematic has this looking like a very organized process. Um, in fact, it's not quite as clean as this might suggest, but the ideas come from every place and any place. So that means every one of you who, are, who is participating in this webinar can be an idea generator um, for either new legislation or for a change in something that's already a law or a policy. And we've had several examples of these kinds of things happen, and that might happen as a result of an experience you have. For example, one success this year with one of our members had to do with a change in a, in a policy regulation that had to do with the number of days that an individual could come home for a therapeutic home visit and have Medicaid continue paying for that individual's bed in a, in a facility. But without going through all the details, that a change in the number of days that decreased the number of days that an individual could have these therapeutic home visits had a detrimental impact on this uh, individual and other individuals similarly situated, in this case an individual with a brain injury. And so his uh, wife took on advocacy to have that changed. And we supported that the Brain Injury Association, she worked directly with the legislators about effecting a change and was ultimately successful in changing that number to go back to a larger number of days that were available. So the details of this example are not as important as understanding that this doesn't have to be kind of the broad health care reform that we're talking about on the federal level or Medicaid redesign that we're involved with on the state level. It could be a very small change that was made that has a huge impact on an individual that leads to the idea and going through the process of effecting a change that also has an impact on, on a number of people. And each one of you has ideas for things you think should be changed. Now this is the process of how a bill becomes a law, but there are also policy changes that occur that don't need legislation necessarily to occur. For example, the governor, and we'll talk about this, can issue an executive order that has the force of law, it doesn't have to go through the legislature. Or we might have something that you want or might suggest an agency commissioner can decide or develop something that has that kind of an impact and all. But again, it all starts with an idea. Now every step of this process, and again, I suppose if I was more expert at working through all of the arrows, I could give us all a headache by having this go all over the place because once we move from an idea to bill drafting to the introduction of a bill, and every step along the way, um, these are opportunities to have influence. These are opportunities for advocacy, starting with the idea to what you think the picture should look like, and that takes the official form of a bill. Ideas have to be put into the proper form before they can be introduced into the legislature, or the proper form before they can take the form of a regulation that, that is open for public comment. Um, and the like, and then be introduced into the appropriate forum. So that may be a House of the State Legislature, either the Assembly or the Senate, or a House of the United States Congress, either the House of Representatives or the um, United States Senate. Or in the case of a regulation, issued and posted in the Federal Register. So all of these steps along the way are opportunities for advocacy, opportunity to become uh, involved. Now the executive budget is introduced in the legislature by the governor. Uh, everything else must be introduced by a legislator or it can be on behalf of a committee 
a standing committee. And since so many of you uh, indicated you know how a bill becomes a law, I really won't take time here um, to go through all of those all of those steps. And do understand that very often um, this is a dynamic process. And so things will bounce around back and forth and back and forth. And you need to be on top of that and um, follow all of the steps. Keep track of where your bill is or where a bill or a piece of legislation that you care about is. And many of you who are um, on our email list, I think, or the email list of other organizations probably get alerts asking you to call now um, or become involved at a particular point. And that's because very often uh, things are time sensitive and so it's important to become involved at various times or at particular times um, with the process. Okay, finding a sponsor, again, we uh, talked about this a little bit. And these next slides really go through the steps. These are, if you are involved, and we are very much involved with some of these things with some of our processes, you need to have a sponsor introducing the policy or the legislation that you want. It's important that the person be from the majority party just because that's the leadership and that matters and be senior. It doesn't mean that you don't want somebody who's from the non-majority party um, to do it, but often you look for partnerships so that you can be bipartisan because it becomes important um, to do that. Now testimony becomes important because again it's an opportunity to, I'm just putting all these up at the same time so we can look at everything. Um, it becomes important to be, to be on record. Uh, generally, testimony is very short because usually the list of people who have an interest in testifying on a particular policy is, um, is long and people don't spend a lot of time there. So the written statement you, you submit can be long. Your oral statement can be short and sweet, less than three minutes if you can do that. I know it's hard and I certainly have trouble keeping my comments to three minutes, but three to five minutes is the best. Um, be clear about what you're going to highlight there and make sure you have written testimony that's much longer or that will fill out what you want to share. If you are telling your story, that's very important. Again, short and sweet with the supporting material to go along with it. Often you're told a time to show up. However, I suggest be there early, um, although bring something to read while you're there because they may not follow the time schedule. People may not show up. You don't want to miss your time, all of those kinds of things. When we know that there are opportunities to testify, we will be sharing those or we have been sharing those um, so that people can try to stay abreast of this. Very often the legislative committees are very busy with, um, with testimony. If you can't show up in person, there is no problem with submitting written testimony that becomes part of the record. Now we all roll in or run into bumps on the road and again I'm not going whoops sorry not going to take time in going through these because so many of you know that the process or what the process looks like. It's very important to just keep on top of the schedule if you are involved with a particular um, piece of legislation um, and the like. So that just becomes important to do. Do understand that all of this takes time, particularly in the legislature, and so we don't generally expect that just because we have a great idea about which we're passionate, it's going to sail through the legislature very quickly. So the third poll question is the following. Are you 
have you met with a legislator already to talk about a particular concern? Okay, so we're sharing the results of that poll, and interesting. it's interesting to me because so many of you indicated that you know how a bill becomes a law, but uh, less than half of you have been involved in talking to legislators. So uh, we will spend the next part of the webinar really talking about how to do that and how to do that effectively. I did want to mention one thing very quickly before we get to that, and that's to give you some sense of time frames although I will say that um, the process of uh, policy development is something that really is a 12-month process, and we'll talk about that again. The piece that is specific, has specific time frames, is the budget. The state fiscal year starts on April 1st, ends on March 31st. The federal fiscal year starts on November 1st and ends on October 31st. It's really a pain in the neck that nothing jives in that sense. But um, it's just important to be aware of those time frames. And our state legislative calendar is now being really starting in January and ending by the middle to end of June. So we've become much more on a regular time frame. Used to be for many, many years, the state did not have a budget in place. Although the fiscal year started April first, the budget did not. The budget was not in place till even into July. So fortunately, we've got away, gotten away from that um, into into something much more regular and in sync. Okay, so talking about. Um, meeting with legislators, and really the rest of this webinar is going to talk about you becoming involved um, in the process. So first thing is to phone for an, uh, for an appointment. I would say that meeting with a legislator, I think a personal visit is the most effective way to communicate with a legislator or to communicate with any policy maker. Um, it puts a face to whatever your issue is. Uh, you have a better opportunity of getting a sense, reading his or her face, trying to gauge what a personal reaction is. You can have some more immediate response and those kinds of things. And also provides an opportunity to get to know each other. Now understand that if you, we're talking about a state legislator, this does not have to occur in Albany. In fact, personally, I think it's often better if it occurs in the local district office because it underscores that you are a constituent, that you are a voter in your legislator's district, and that's very, very important. This is the same thing with um, are congressional leaders. It doesn't have to occur in Washington. These visits can occur in the local office, and each congressional representative has actually more than one local office, and each senator will have local offices. So know that you do not have to travel to Albany or to Washington in order to be effective. And also, you're likely to have more time. Now one caution here is when you have a meeting or when you call for an appointment, often you may be meeting with a staff member. Now I've been with many people who say, oh, if I can't meet with my state senator, then it's not good. But I think, again, it's very important to meet with staff. And I say that from the perspective of having been a staff member, both of a governor of the first Governor Cuomo, and also on congressional staff. 
it is the staff person who does the work. And there's a staff person who will give your information to the legislator. And it is the staff person who you want to call you when there's a question. And so it, it's very important to be meeting with staff people as well. And if you are meeting with a legislator, often they'll have a staff person there. And that's the person that you will be following up with. So that becomes important. Now it's important to get an appointment, schedule an appointment first. Please don't just show up and expect to have time. If you want to show up and say, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to make an appointment. I'd like to leave you some material and I'll call up. That's fine. If you show up and say, I'd like to see XYZ state senator, uh, that will be hard. Now, if you're phoning for an appointment, you might be asked how long you think you might need. I would suggest not to ask for more than half an hour, generally 15 minutes. Time is short, and so you need to be considerate. And you need to be um, timely, show up on time, but also understand if you're meeting with someone during a session, that things may happen that will pull him or her to a meeting, a committee meeting, a vote, those kinds of things. And so you just need to accommodate that. Also, as I said earlier, do your homework, be prepared. Um, you may want to know how the legislator, or you should know how the legislator has tended to vote on your issue or similar kinds of issues. Always introduce yourself, your name, where you live, because again, you're underscoring that you're a constituent. If you're representing an organization, uh, you may give a little description, very, very short. Um, don't overdo it about that. Um, but you also don't have to be representing an organization. Try to remain focus, focused, identify the reason for your visit. If you're talking about a specific piece of legislation, have the bill number. Don't say, I'm here supporting or we want your support for A1234 because that individual may have no idea what A1234 is. But if you say for concussion management, here's a copy of the bill and give the bill number, that will be much better. If it's a bill that's working its way through the legislative process or that's scheduled to be on the floor for a vote, you might want to share that information as well. That becomes very important. You explain why you support that particular piece of legislation and all. Um, and allow, bring a one-page fact sheet. Um, legislators and staff like short, condensed information. Try to make it one page if you can. Listen carefully to questions and concerns because they may well have been lobbied or talked to by people on the other side of your particularly issue, of your particular issue. Very important to uh, relate your personal experience, why you care about this particular bill and what it will accomplish. Come prepared, as I said, and definitely allow time for questions. You're there as a resource. And that becomes very important. And be prepared for questions. I've been in meetings where a legislator or a staff member will ask a question that's actually a pretty reasonable question. And the individual is just totally taken aback. So be prepared for questions. And frankly, questions show interest. And that's a good thing. And also ask the legislator or the staff whether or not that individual will support or vote against the bill, will be in agreement with what you want to have happen. Important to ask for something specific when you're doing these kinds of, this kind of advocacy. At the end, very important, no matter what the outcome is, very important to thank the individual for their time, for consideration of the meeting, of meeting with you. Um, I think it's always important to leave your name, address, and phone number at the end, even if you didn't do it at the beginning. Um, and also to sign the guest book. Many offices still have these. You want it on record that you visited. 
and to write a follow-up thank you letter or an email and the like. Short and sweet, but very, very important to do all of these. So, you know, it's not easy. It all takes grunt work to do, but very important. Now, writing a letter, this has gone a little out of fashion, but I think it's still important, and I understand that partly because there's so little uh, letter writing these days that letters tend to stand out. Again, keep it brief. Have um, information attached to it. If you're writing about a particular piece of legislation, always have the bill number with it. Introduce yourself and your interest, why you care about it, what your position is, provide additional assistance, request an answer, and say thank you at the end. Um, if you're calling, and again, calls are effective, uh, identify yourself. These all follow the same pattern, but again, it's very important information. Identify yourself, give the information, why you care about it, what you want, offer to give additional information, and leave your telephone number for calling back and saying thank you. Uh, other forms of communication, email everybody now. Every single office is set up for email. You can do this all through the websites for each, uh, each representative on the federal level and the state level. They are geared to receiving email from a constituent. So if you are not a constituent, but nonetheless, it's important to communicate because that person is in a leadership position. You're going to have to work around the email, and you'll do that by making a phone call or sending a fax or dropping by a piece of paper, sending a letter, and the like. Um, some people communicate by Facebook. These days, many of the, if not all of the legislators, have Facebook pages you could become involved through their Facebook pages as well. The social media opportunities, tweeting and the like, all of those are opportunities for you to engage in providing your information, providing a story and all with your communication. So all of those are opportunities to do it. Part of what I like about some of this, to tell you the truth, is that as the communication has become easier, it's easier for you to individualize that. It used to be, and, and we also provide templates for people to become involved. But what's most important is that with any kind of template is that you make it your own, that you tell your story, why it matters to you. And with the uh, many different forms of communication, it becomes easier for you to do that. And again, it's what each of us brings to this discussion that, that is important. And I know from the involvement we've had with visits both in the state legislature and with our group that has been involved in doing visits in Congress in Washington, during the Congressional Brain Injury Awareness Day in March, um, as we have organized what the points are, what the purpose of the visit is, who is the constituent, having the conversation, the more you do it, like many things, the more you do it, the more you become comfortable with it, and the more you um, relax into it. And that becomes very important. Nobody has to go at any of this alone. There are ways to put together groups for the visits. The written communication, you can always have help with and do it, review it before you send it in. But these are all opportunities to become involved. Just remember the elements of that. Um, be clear if you're talking about a particular bill or a regulation to identify what that is, identify yourself, what your interest is, why you come to this issue, uh, how the policy issue will have an impact, what you would like the legislator to do, offer to provide additional information, and say thank you. 
And every one of these slides that's looked at that has talked about providing those kinds of things. So this says the world, the world does not stop just because the legislative session ends. And this is why I said that really the process of policy development is a 12-month process. Things are always going on. Things are always going on. It's a cyclical process, whether it's legislators or legislation on the state level, on the federal level, whether we're talking about regulatory change, and certainly for individual advocacy, it's the same thing. And a word about individual advocacy, in fact, that too is something that is on an ongoing basis. And it's the same steps. It is truly the same steps. But it's not to say just, be, just because the legislature goes home or is in recess that you go home or that things stop. There are always opportunities to keep going and reasons to become involved in that. So lots of activities when people go home in their home district. And you can look, look for those. Look for when your local congressional representative may be holding a town hall meeting or a corner um, session just to hear what constituents have to say, or a meet and greet, or any of those kinds of things. And if you can get there, get there and meet and greet and say, hi, my name is Judy Avner. Uh, thank you so much for your support of health care reform. It really meant a lot to me as a person who's involved in the brain injury community. You know, any of those kinds of things. Legislative committee work goes on all of the time as well. Public hearings often happen when legislatures are not in session because there's more time to think about this. And this could be to gain input. What should we be thinking of? What do we think? How did something work? Campaigns, of course, are always involved and always looking for volunteers. And there's always the opportunity to think about the next session. What should we be doing? What might we be doing? And those are all opportunities. Now, other important players, the governor. And of course, in New York State, our governor, governors are always important as the chief executive. And our governor certainly is uh, a major player and has shown his muscle on any number of occasions in really uh, being willing to identify his top priorities and really throwing the full weight of his office and influence behind those. And we've seen a number of them in, in our state. Uh, recently in this session, major one, in the whole change to create a new agency looking at uh, providing effective oversight for facilities in which uh, individuals with disabilities are receiving services. And, all. and that was a very important priority issue for him. But the governor is always an important player. And even if what we contact the governor about or you contact the governor about is not a major policy issue, I always encourage people, uh, even if you're doing individual advocacy, to send a letter to the governor uh, or to go on the governor's email and send an email uh, to the governor or a communication because this governor, as many governors, are, has a staff that's interested in hearing what people are thinking. And this governor has been proactive in, in inviting New Yorkers to become involved in that process. So put them to the test and send in what's on your mind. State agencies also, many of us work closely with the State Department of Health the State uh, Office for Persons with um, Developmental in Disabilities, with New Justice Center, all of these agencies, State Education Department, Department of Labor, these are all important agencies in developing policies or in implementing laws that have passed. Other kinds of policymakers at every uh, step of the way, and the courts. And we know, of course, from the most recent Supreme Court decision, that the courts are an important player. Um, you won't be kind of educating the courts in the same way as you might do outreach 
to the executive branch or the legislative branch of government, but often people do resort to filing lawsuits as a way of influencing policy. And that becomes very important to just follow how that process occurs. Working with the executive, again, understanding which is the appropriate agency. If you're talking generally about brain injury, the New York State Department of Health is the lead agency um, in, in New York State for that. Always good to keep the state agency informed of what's on your mind, what you're doing, and seeking some support. The Traumatic Brain Injury Services Coordinating Council may also be an important player for you. Meetings are held three times a year. The next one will be, I believe, in the fall. The date hasn't been announced yet, but it will be announced. Um, you can contact the Brain Injury Association if you um, want to know the date. We are always posting those, as does the State Department of Health, Independent Living Council, the Developmental Disabilities Planning Council, and other uh, kind of councils, advisory committees within the executive branch of government that may have an impact on issues of concern for you. Again, don't forget the governor. He, you wouldn't anyway, and as I said, he should be a key part of your advocacy efforts and all. Um, Effective communication, again, use the range of communication that's available to you and choose a messenger that's appropriate to the medium that you're using. Media, again, very, very important. Uh, key reporters, and again, if you are a member of the Brain Injury Association, uh, or if you are involved in the brain injury community, we would like to be coordinating with you on doing this uh, outreach and advocacy with the media, radio and television. Often uh, stations will reach out to the Brain Injury Association or to a particular program looking for a spokesperson uh, or we like to work with our members to provide a package that has a local hook, as it were, for the uh, for the media um, in a particular area. And again, it's important to have the best person who can move your mission. We all, or many people, like to be on TV. It's very glitzy and all, but it needs to be the best person to move forward. Uh, and always role play or be comfortable. Um, in preparation before. Letters to the editor, again, all online these days. Link it to something that's been in the newspaper. Keep it simple, why you care about it. Make it local. Um, use names. Use your credentials if you want. Follow up. Um, think strategically. Don't write every moment because they get sick of it. But do write if there's something of concern to you. Um, op-eds are on the opposite side of the editorial uh, page. Again, um, longer than a letter to the editor, much more selective, but you do have more time to do to, uh, or more space to make your point for that. PSAs, we all see them. Uh, again, very simple um, and very to the point. News conferences, they don't happen so much anymore. Uh, sparingly, again, it all depends on what's going on. But if you have something timely, dramatic, a celebrity, something good, this might be a good medium uh, for you to use. And these are some other venues um, that, you might, that you might use, again, to, to create uh, community awareness and all. Coalitions, very important, um, working together, and it's not necessarily, I'm going to put all these up at one time. Again, I apologize for the animation, but it's not, uh, people think working in coalition is just easy. Anybody who's done it knows that it can be very challenging, um, and so these are just some steps in trying to give order 
to developing a coalition. Uh, having partners working in coalition is very important because everybody brings something different to working together and understanding how to, how to do that. And again, these in the brain injury field, these are just some potential members of a coalition. Individuals, organizations, professionals, different perspectives. And all the broader the coalition, the better in terms of showing the reach of your, um, of your message. And, all. and so I come back to this about making a lot of friends, because that's what a coalition is, before I need them. Really important, and I hope that that's a message you've gotten through this webinar, really, really important to be known, be a resource, be out there before you have to ask somebody for something, whether it's a legislator, the governor, policymaker, or somebody to join your coalition or be involved with you. Um, all very important in this, in this process. Um, this is about the Brain Injury Association of New York State. What I'd like to, these are some of our programs. We have very little time left, and I'd like to answer some questions that I'm seeing. Uh, please text them, and I can answer them um, as they come. What I'd like to tell you is that, again, this is a kickoff, really, for an effort of the Brain Injury Association of New York State to um, help provide some information skills for our members or those in the brain injury community to become involved with us as part of a more potent um, advocacy force uh, within New York State. There are a number of policy issues that we will be um, that we will be uh, supporting becoming more proactive on more publicly. We've been involved, of course, in policy advocacy all of the time, as well as in individual advocacy. This is something we are involved in every day through all of our programs, through our family advocacy counseling and training and services program and our information and resources, other conversations uh, and trainings we do around the state. Um, you'll be seeing our suggestions or our announcements of workshops and the like, really of getting, getting people together. These slides will be posted on our website. Um, we will have other handouts that go together with our advocacy uh, initiatives going forward, we did, and this does build on a program we had at our annual conference. Um, methods of identify, okay, there's a question going back to methods of identifying or recruiting sponsors of a bill. I think the first step, once you have clear what your idea is, is to look at the legislators, particularly the uh, legislators who are in the majority party, to see if there's somebody who you think or who has a record that's in sync with what you are interested in. So that if it's something relating to um, brain injury, can you find somebody who has supported, if they have longevity, who was involved in the initial efforts back in the 90s to pass the uh, brain injury law having in New York State, for example, or who has um, supported something having to do with brain injury in New York State. And the Brain Injury Association can help you kind of sort through or do that kind of analysis. Um, you might also, if you have a relationship with your legislator, which with your local legislator, you might want to identify that individual as a place to go and say, look, I have this idea. Is this something of interest to you? What do you suggest as a way of moving forward? Make people your partner in doing this. Make your 
state senator, state assembly member, local rep your representative, make them your partner in doing this. They will feel good about that and get some ownership and some buy-in. And so there's no hard and fast rules about it except to do the analysis and the homework around, around that going forward. That will become important. And those are themes, I think, that I've mentioned as we go through. Um, I think that our time is up. I have our contact information, of course, here. So feel free to email or to call uh, and ask other questions. You know that we are involved in this process. If you are not a member of the Brain Injury Association, I would encourage you to become a member and become part of this force and this voice and the voice of brain injury. Very, very important to do that. And membership information, of course, is available on our website. This is information about the next scheduled webinar um, for us that we're sponsoring. You can also like us on Facebook. And uh, I hope you all have a good day. Again, these slides will be posted. Please look for the next step and workshops coming to your community about advocacy and becoming involved in that. Thank you very much for your interest.